when you stand before the King. Jesus is the only way. Jesus is the only way. And he walked upon the water one sweet day. say. He's the only way, folks. Amen. <clears throat> Earthly pleasures vainly call me. I would be like Jesus. Nothing worldly shall enthrall me. I would be like Jesus. Be like Jesus, this my song. In the home and in the throng. Be like Jesus all day long. I would be like Jesus, that in heaven he may meet me, I would be like Jesus, that his words well done may greet me, I would be like Jesus, be like Jesus, this my song, in the home and in the throng. Be like Jesus all day long. I would be like Jesus. Let love in your soul You may search the heaven But to be just as before You'll never find true satisfaction If you can have 
and for fame and fortune, all the world you could attain, yet you had not Christ with you. cannot help you win. I'll come to Jesus, for only He can satisfy. speak a little bit in Galatians about the grace of God. This morning I want to uh, go back into Galatians again and uh, pick up kind of where I left off last week and uh, say a few more words about what I believe God's grace is and how we are to come within that boundary of grace. Uh, Galatians chapter 3. I'm going to start with verse 1 and I'm going to read through to verse 2. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Oh, Heavenly Father, I, I thank you for sending Jesus. And Lord, as we've heard this morning through the praise and worship, Lord, you are our center of attention, Lord Jesus, and only you can satisfy our soul. Yes. Father, please help us this morning, those here and those who may be watching at some time on the television, Lord, to, to have this truth settled in them about your grace, Lord God. Help us, Lord, by your word. Your word is truth, and we thank you in Jesus' name. The Apostle Paul brought quite an accusation, quite an exhortation, a, a note of correction here to the Galatian people. Today, I believe that these verses and the following verses have been used by an element within the Church of Christ to excuse or maybe even exonerate those who would go beyond the limits set by the law of Christ and the grace of God. You see, Paul here is, is 
is asking people who have been taught by Jewish converts. And, and, and some of those Jewish converts had not truly come into a standing of faith. They wanted to lean upon the law totally. Now, as we spoke of before, we've got to have the law as a guidepost. All right, God never goes back on his word or back on his ways. And the law is there for us to know what sin is and to know how God expects us to live. Okay, so, but you have Jewish people who were influenced by the old Jewish ways. And they, they wanted to impose upon some of these Galatian people a, a, the law, again. And that in order for them to be saved, they had to live a, according to everything that was in the law. Now, we'll go on and I'll explain this further. But Paul was correcting these people, asking them, how did you receive the Spirit? Was it because you obeyed the law so good, or was it by faith? And of course, we receive the Spirit of God by faith. One of the things that I, I, I see it, and, 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 and brothers and sisters, it alarms me, and, uh, and at my age, I'm always at controversy with it. It seems like I'm, I'm right in the middle of two generations. We've got the older church, what I will call the older church, the, the, the blessed saints who have been in the Lord for many years, and, and they still hold to the ways of the, uh, say, the pre turn of the century church. You know, they're, they're, and they believe in holiness. And, and holiness is, is not only a state of mind to these older brothers and sisters, it's, it's a state of life that they, they live like they believe God wants them to live. And I'm between that group and the younger group, which seems to want to take these verses and other verses that Paul had preached and, and, and make God's grace with no boundaries at all to where you know, we can go on and we can dress like everybody else, you know, and we can act like everybody else, and we can perform like everybody else. But brothers and sisters, that is not what Paul is telling these Galatian people. That is not at all what the Word of God tells us. If, if, if we're Christians, we're children of God, as Peter said, we are peculiar people. We're not supposed to be following what the world does or what, or what other people say we're supposed to be doing. There, there is no... There's no change in the way the Spirit works today as it did back before the turn of the century. Or yonder before that, when Peter and Paul preached this, this word of life, the truth of God, and, and, and taught the people the gospel, the Spirit has not moved and, and changed so that we can uh, be more like the world that we're supposed to come out of. A few weeks ago, we had... Uh, or a couple weeks ago, we had the Memorial Day. And we said a lot about remembering things. You know, uh, we, we didn't, no one mentioned remember Lot's wife. You know, that was, it's one of the verses in the Bible, other than when it says Jesus wept. And I find that peculiar sometimes, where they divided up the Bible. And I look at the verses, and I see that the easiest one for me to remember was Jesus wept. And the next one was remember Lot's wife. Okay, and that's in uh, Luke 17 or 19, somewhere around there. Remember Lot's wife. Why did he say that? He said that because as Christians, well, there's always a, a connection here between being a Christian and looking at the state of Israel, or the way God dealt with Israel, and with the people of God, Lot being a descendant of Abraham. But remember Lot's wife. See, the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, as, jo as Brother Joe is always reminding us, is a solid example for us today. Did God's grace, was God's grace bestowed upon Sodom and Gomorrah? Yes, I believe it was. For Abraham pleaded for the people of Sodom. Abraham said, Lord, and he got to the point where, hey, if, if there's ten people, okay, who will do righteously, okay, who will listen to God in this place, okay, I'll show my grace upon it, and I'll, I'll spare it. But 
But man, there wasn't 10 people in that city or the surrounding cities who would hear God's word. So the Lord sends his angels. They go to this city. The, the people do their thing with them and the angels grab Lot, his wife, and his, and his daughters and say, we got to get out of here. Whatever you do, do not look back. Do not look back. And as they're leaving the city, Lot's wife looked back back in order for us to properly live within the grace of God in the spirit okay, we must put on the mind of Christ Lot's wife in her mind she was in turmoil between the things of the flesh and, and believing what God had said to them through his angels don't look back so she sent her and like Man, she could not part in her mind from the things of the, the life that she was leaving. She couldn't. She looked back. When we come to Christ, don't look back. I, I'm standing here this morning. I've got to say that there were many things and many times when I've had to ask the Lord to forgive me because I've acted and done the things that I did before I knew Christ. Many times I've become aggravated and lost my patience with people. But let me tell you, when you come to Christ, His... Oh, Lord, give me the ability to preach your word. Remember Lot's wife. Don't look back. Don't go back to those things. Don't even, don't, don't care about those things. Come out and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and I'll be your God and you'll be my children. You know... When I first believed on God, when I first believed on Jesus, I'm getting back to the law now. I didn't know the law. Many of you didn't know the law. But that did not make us... Oh, how would I say this? We were still responsible before God, whether we knew the law or not. But I believed on Jesus by faith without even knowing the law. But yet, as we'll read here further, well, let's go to that. Let's go over to verse 11 in chapter 3. Or yet, verse 10 in chapter 3. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. For the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. In the prophet somewhere it says that I will put my my, 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 my law, my word into the hearts of the people. I'll pour out my spirit upon them. If you're a Christian, if you've been baptized in the spirit, truly baptized in the spirit, I'm not talking about some sacramental thing. I'm talking about truly being humble before God and desiring the righteousness of God. And then you have those things in your heart. And whether you not know the law or not, the spirit moves you to keep them and you walk in them, you uphold them. And there's a separation between you and the world. I've got one example of this. And uh, maybe many of you didn't know this, but turn to Deuteronomy chapter 14. And maybe it's not so much an example of what, I, of, of what I've said, but I want to show you something as far as uh, not knowing the law. Deuteronomy 14, verses 9 and 10. These are dietary codes, dietary laws, which were part of the package of the law. And, and there's a lot of them. But the, these two, are, this, this one here I want to mention, and just make a, a, a small point, and then I'll come real close. These you shall eat of all, the, all that are in the waters, all that have fins and scales shall you eat. And whatsoever hath not fins and scales you may not eat. It is unclean to you. The law made it very clear to the people of Israel what was clean and what was not clean. 
In Peter it says, Be ye holy, as I am holy. In Leviticus it said that to the people of Israel. Be ye holy. There's always a comparison drawn between the church of God and the people of Israel. Now, we have just read one of the dietary laws. Do not eat a fish that doesn't have scales. I never knew that. When I got saved, I didn't know that. I, I, it, it was above me, beyond me. I, but if I was a Jewish scholar, or, or, or someone who had sat underneath a Jewish teacher for many, many years in the synagogue, I would have known that, hey, it, it, as an Orthodox Jew, it wasn't right for me to eat a trout because it doesn't have scales. Or eat eel because it doesn't have scales. It wasn't right. You couldn't do that. It was against the, the law, you know. You just couldn't do that. But by faith, by faith in Christ, those are the things. Those are the things that Paul was teaching these people. Those are the things that we don't have to be specific about. We don't have to worry about our dietary laws. We sang a song this morning, the kingdom of God is not meat nor truth, but righteousness, Amen. peace, and joy. Righteousness. The righteousness of God. Yes, there are moral codes in the law of Christ. There is a dress code. Many people don't want to believe that, but there is a dress code. In Timothy, Paul, I believe it was Timothy, where Paul said that the women should adorn themselves modestly. Now, I'm not just picking on women. Us men have to observe these things too, modestly, modestly. That means we can't be looking through the Calvin Klein magazine for clothes sometimes. Okay? Okay. All right. Lord, help us. So I want to end with this. And I've already said it back in Galatians. The just shall live by faith. If time allows and pastor permits, maybe next week I'll go on with that a little bit and we'll talk about following God and putting on the mind of Christ. I want to read some scriptures. I've got this little paper from the rescue mission. I don't know if you get this rescue mission paper. Are any of you ever get this rescue mission paper? Sue's going. I don't know what that means, yes or no. You get them? You do get these? Okay. No, you don't want no money. Okay? No. This is a pastor's connection to the Syracuse Rescue Mission. Okay, this says uh, what pastors should know. So I'm going to share with you what pastors should know. Now, you're not pastors, but please, just bear with us, okay? <coughs> hey, you want to learn something that pastors should know this morning? How many would like to learn what the pastors should know? Let me see your hands. Brother Joe, let me see your hand. I don't see your hand. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> Are we all set? This uh, month, the rescue mission sent me uh, this paper, and I'd like to share it with you because I feel that it's important today that we should learn these things, talk about some of these things. And I'm going to read a little bit from the book of Genesis just quickly. Not going to keep you too long. What time is it? 11? 11 o'clock? 5 of 11? I call that 11. Anything within 5 minutes one way or the other, I call it 11. Okay. The rescue mission sends me this paper again. <clears throat> it says, what pastors should know about alcohol. I find this interesting because we don't hear pastors talk about this problem. It's, it's something that is a, a no-show at churches. And I'd like to read what they have, just a few things here. I'd like to speak a little bit about this this morning. And I believe this goes along with what Brother Mark has been talking about this morning. That when we come to Christ, the Bible says that old things pass away. That's what Brother Mark is talking about. And so he asked me a couple of weeks ago if he could mention some of these things, and I says, go to it. <laughs> go to it. And we need to hear in this modern New Age churches that we have today, we need to hear the old gospel message. 
Do you know that the gospel message has not changed? Men have changed. Their thoughts have changed. Their ideas have changed. Their loves have changed. But the gospel has not changed this morning. And so let me read this a little bit. As I said again, this is from the rescue mission in Syracuse, New York, sent me this. I thought it was very good and I want to share it with you. It says, what pastors should know about alcohol? Alcohol is without a doubt America's most abused drug. Witness the devastation. Alcoholism has become this nation's third largest health problem behind only heart disease and cancer. Can you imagine that? It kills more people than any known drug besides contributing to many suicides. The afflictions, an estimated 10 million Americans. The Journal of the American Medical Association points out that 97% of all alcohols, alcoholics inhabit our offices, factories, or schools. Finally, adolescence use, use continues to increase. Because alcohol is legal and easy to purchase, up to 93% of American teenagers have at least tried it. In turn, the drug kills more youths than anything else and causes 50% of all auto accidents. A national watchdog group reports that 3.3 million Americans between 14 and 17 are alcoholics. One in every nine teens, most of them began with their parents' alcohol stock at home. Many have no idea that one can of beer contains as much alcohol as a glass of wine or a shot of whiskey. Alcohol depresses the, the, the central nervous system, which in turn impairs coordination, judgment, and reflexes, and causes hallucinations, inappropriate behavior, harmful withdrawal symptoms, it impairs the memory, damages the internal organs, and can kill or damage a fetus through uh, fetal alcohol syndrome. Now the symptoms of alcoholism, odor on the breath, heavy use of breath fresheners, droopy eyelids, glazed eyes, which have trouble focusing, unusual behavior, passive or aggressive behavior, poor physical coordination or uncooperativeness, absenteeism or poor job performance, change in peer groups or trouble relating with others, loss of memory, blackouts, depression and confusion. <clears throat> Here they talk about, the rest of this talks about taking steps toward treatment of alcoholism and, and, and what they should do. And, and the rescue mission does offer uh, a program. And if there's anyone listening to me, if you have a problem and you can't get help, the rescue mission, if you contact the rescue mission, they will help you. I, wa I do want to say something here. What it says here, it says, um, there are many ways a user can be forced into the best programming treatment. He or she must be willing and have the desire to get well in order for that treatment to succeed. Alcoholics often will deny their problem and trained counselors may be required to do uh, a, a, an intervention. The counselor can, use, uh, can usually guide a person through a program intake process. If all else fails, Continue to apply tough love until the alcoholic agrees to help. Now listen, alcoholic, alcoholism is a chronic and primary disorder that can only be treated by a lifelong commitment to total abstinence with help from the Lord. And this is what the rescue mission is talking about here. And this is what I, I find this to be a very good article on alcoholism. I think it's... It's, as it says here, that it affects millions and millions of Americans every day. 
It's, it's, it's something that is very harmful to your health, and you may not be an alcoholic, you may not drink at all, but when you get out in the car, remember that 50% of all accidents are attributed to alcoholism or to drinking, so that you may be not involved in it, and you may not drink at all, but when you get out in your car, you may be hit by somebody who does drink. So therefore, I believe that, uh, that, w that we should talk to those who, uh, who do drink, and we ought to tell them, uh, for the sake of our loved ones, don't drink. <laughs> don't drink. Amen? But now let me touch on this just a minute. Just a moment, Joe. Uh, let me touch on this for just a moment on another thought that, and bring this to what Brother Mark was saying. Brother Mark said that when we come to Christ, we become a new creature. Okay? And we become a new person. Now, if you loved your drinking or you loved alcoholism or, you, or, or the drink or the, or the taste of the alcohol, if it affected your body, if you liked what it did for you, and you realize that it is harmful, you've got to realize that it is, it's, there's no good thing in it, that it is harmful to you, and you've got to leave it for the sake of yourself and for the sake of others. Okay, and we're, I'm going to be talking a little bit about it. Okay, let's turn to Genesis in chapter 9, and let me just quickly read these verses. And uh, uh, bear with me here. And this is the story, uh, Noah, and we talk about Noah quite a bit. Noah, remember, was the one who built the ark at the hand of God. God told him to go and build an ark. And, and then, remember, there's a great flood on the earth. Well, this is the occurrence after the flood. And this speaks of alcoholism and uh, the use of alcohol or the misuse of alcohol here. And if we were to find a shining example in God's Word of somebody who loved the Lord, somebody who uh, had faith in God's Word, somebody who trusted in what God said, I don't think that we could find anyone who could do a better or fill those shoes better than Noah. Noah loved the Lord. The Bible says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? But let's read about it here. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the whole chapter. Right? Just quickly, I'm going to go through this chapter and just follow along with me. Chapter 9 of Genesis and those that are watching at home, uh, please uh, turn to the book of Genesis or find time to read this chapter. Chapter 9. Uh, God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air and upon all that moveth upon the earth and all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Every, even as the green herb have I given you all things. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, you shall not eat. And surely your blood of your lives will be required at the hand of every beast will I require it, and at the hand of every man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. You and you be, be ye fruitful and multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth, and multiply therein. And God spake unto Noah and his sons with him, saying, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you, and with your seed after you, and with every living creature that is with you, and the fowl of the cattle, of the fowl of the cattle, of every beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. And I will establish my covenant with you, neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of flood, neither shall there be any more a flood to destroy the earth. And God said this, is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass that, uh, that when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters 
shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, and that I uh, may remember an everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of, the fl of all flesh that is upon the earth. And God said to Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. And the sons of Noah that went forth uh, of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Ham is the father of Canaan. And these are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole earth overspread. And Noah began to be a husbandman, and he planted a vineyard. And he drank of the wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered with his, within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment, and laid it up on both their shoulders, and went backwards and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah woke from his wine, and knew what his younger son had done. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and of Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. And Noah lived after the flood three hundred and fifty years, and all the days of Noah were nine hundred and fifty years, and he died. Now, this particular chapter, and we don't have time to hit the whole thing today, but I want to just speak a little bit about a couple of things that are in here. First of all, that God made a covenant with mankind again here and, and set as a token of his covenant the rainbow that we see in the sky. When you look at that rainbow, every time you see that rainbow, that is a mark or a covenant or a sign that God made with mankind. Isn't that wonderful, uh, kids, that when you see the rainbow, you ever see the rainbow up in the sky? Huh? When you see that rainbow, the Bible says that God made a covenant with man and said, I will never more send a flood upon the earth. And this is, this is uh, the graciousness of God. And we can look at that even to this very day and see that great covenant that God made here. And as we go down, we find that God now tells Noah and his sons to go out and multiply and replenish the earth. Now, the earth had to be replenished. You know why? Because there were no more people in it except those eight people that were saved by the flood or, or from that flood that God had uh, caused Noah and his sons and their wives and his wife to go into the ark. And when they came out of the ark, there was nobody left. And so they were told, go out and replenish the earth. And so the earth was replenished by the three sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And uh, if we had from verse 20 down to about 26 or 27, if we had not that incident in the word of God, I wonder what other things would have been written about Noah. Uh, the Bible says here that he lived after the flood 350 years. If I were to sit down and write a little story of my life, I think I could find a couple of chapters. Not too much, but maybe a couple of chapters. And I'm only in my 50s. Huh? I'm not 300 years old. But can you imagine somebody who lived another 300 years? What great things he might have to share with us. But I believe that because of the, an incident that happened here, that it is a sign to us of something that happens when we get away from God and we move away from his word. And here we have what I will call this morning the curse of drink. The curse of drink, this chapter ends with a curse. It ends with the curse of not just one individual, but the curse of a whole generation of people because of the incident of what happened concerning this drink over here. And let me read it again, and let's look at it again. Here it says that he, in verse 20, it says, Noah began to be a husbandman, and he planted a vineyard. And there's nothing wrong with that. How many of us have gardens, and we 
have fruits that we get from our gardens. But then it says that he drank wine and was drunken and he was uncovered within his tent. And the, the, what we read about drinking is a word that is often related with the word drink is nakedness. Nakedness is a term not only meaning to be publicly naked and not have clothing on, but it exposes some part of you that shouldn't be exposed. You know, it's good that we have our little, our little uh, uh, things about us, and, and some parts of us are not to be exposed, not to be put out. If you have a part of you that, that uh, you have a problem, perhaps you have a, uh, a time uh, in your weaknesses that you lose your temper, your anger, uh, or, or perhaps there's times you do and say things you shouldn't do, that you hold your control of yourself. Uh, I know that sometimes some, a great event will happen in your life, something that, that, that uh, upsets your emotions, and somebody may come over to you, grab you by the shoulders and shake you and say, get a hold of yourself! <laughs> Hang on to yourself! And you can hold yourself. You hold back the tears. You hold back something that's in you. You're holding it back. You have control. But alcohol, wine, removes that control that you have. And it exposes some part of you inside that you, you begin to lose control. You, you begin to fall into a situation where your memory perhaps uh, begins to lose your memory a little bit or perhaps you have an outburst of something you say something that you really don't mean comes out of you or perhaps sometimes uh, alcohol will bring confusion into your life and always brings depression remember that alcohol is a depressant it is not something that makes you happy People like to think, well, I'm going to have a few beers and I'm going to forget everything. That is not true. That's not true. You may forget some things, but alcohol, that glass of wine is a depressant. It depresses you. Okay? And so here we find Noah to be drunk and he was lying uncovered in his tent. Now the Bible speaks, as I said, quite a bit about nakedness. And I want to turn to one scripture in Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 15. Uh, Habakkuk is one of the minor prophets. Chapter 2 and verse 15. It says, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, and putteth the bottle to him, and maketh him drunken also, that thou may lookest upon his nakedness. And now here we have in the incident of Noah, we have a physical nakedness where he laid naked in his tent, the Bible said. But alcohol brings not only that nakedness, but another type of nakedness, which is much worse than that nakedness. So here he is, he's, he's in his tent, covered, and Ham, one of the sons, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers without. Now let me tell you what this verse says. Let me talk about this verse a little bit. There's nothing funny about a drunk. And the reason that there's nothing funny about a drunk is that the Bible teaches us that a drunk cannot go to heaven. You know, I truly believe that God has given us a certain amount of stamina, each one of us. And the Bible says that God would not allow us to be tempted above that which we are able, but with the temptation, he would provide a way of escape. Above that which we are able, God gave us an ability to have a certain stamina to stand against certain things. The devil comes against us. And God brings stamina in our life. But alcohol takes away the stamina. It takes away your ability to stand up. It takes up 
It, it just makes you passive. You give in. There's nothing funny about drunkenness. And here we find Ham went out and he began to speak to his two brothers about his father's drunkenness. And the word comes to me, mockery. Begin to mock his father. Do you know that the Bible says there's a place for mockers? There's a place that God has reserved for those who mock God's people? Now let me tell you, Noah made a mistake. Noah got drunk. Noah sinned. When somebody sins, when some brother falls into sin, we don't need to mock him. We need to help him. The Bible says help somebody. It doesn't say mock them. When somebody is, is in trouble and they're falling down, we've got to do what we can to lift that brother up. Not, not kick him while he's down. And this is what Ham did. Ha! Mr. Know-it-all. Mr. Smart Guy. Did you hear, did you see what's going on? Your dad's in there drunk. And he's naked. Ha, 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 ha. Got a big laugh out of it. Do we laugh when somebody falls into sin? Do we say, he thinks he's so smart and look what he's doing? Or do we cry to God and ask God, Lord, help that individual? And do we try to reach that brother in a way, the way the other two brothers did and we're going to read about it? There's an old saying, you know, among families, says that you don't hang your dirty wash out. How does that go? Something like that, isn't it? Where you say you don't take your dirty wash and hang it outside or something. Huh? How does that go? Something like that. In other words, when we, when, if there's something going on and, and there's a sin or a problem, you don't go out and advertise it to everybody. Sister, you don't air your dirty linen. That's true. What do we do? When we have a problem in the church or we have a problem with a brother or sister in the Lord, we go to that brother and sister and we try to correct the problem. It's good for everybody. It's not only good for you, it's not only good for that brother, it's not only good for the church, but it's good for the world too. It's good for everybody. And it's good for God. Of course, it isn't good for the devil. But we don't want to make things good for the devil, do we? Is your heart set on things heavenly? Are you sold out to Jesus thoroughly? When you speak to friends each day, do you tell them he's the way? many trials often you may stumble on the way but at sunset when you lay your head down then ask Jesus to forgive your sins this day is your Set on things heavenly. Are you sold out to Jesus thoroughly? When you speak to friends each day, do you tell them he's the way? Is your heart set on things heavenly? He came into my heart and made me whole, eternal life, and Jesus is 
my goal. Now my name is written on that roll, cause I've got resurrection living in my soul. I've got resurrection living in my soul. I've got resurrection living in my soul. Now my name is written on that roll, cause I've got resurrection living in my soul. The one who took my sin away when he suffered on the cross that day. Now my name is written on that road. I've got resurrection living in my soul. 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 Now my name is written on that roll. Cause I've got resurrection living in my soul. I'm happy, can't you see? My Savior's pardon me. He's taken all my sins away. I've lived eternally. A million years from now, a million years from now, I'll still have Jesus for my friend a million years from now. He washed me in his blood. He washed me in his blood. He changed my heart and renewed my mind. Oh, what a cleansing flood. A million years from now. A million years from now, I'll still have Jesus for my friend. A million years from now, in the twinkling of an eye, I'll meet him in the sky. I'll ride the clouds with the angels there in the twinkling of an eye. A million years from now, a million years from now, I'll still have Jesus for my friend, a million years from now. Well, I know the Lord is good, He always told me that He would. Take care of all my need and strengthen me. So I trust him, yes I do. In this pilgrim land he's true. Jesus, yes Jesus rescued me. He rescued me from troubled water. He rescued me and now I'm free. He rescued me and I do love him. Yes, Jesus rescued me. If you're troubled in this land and can't find a helping hand, call on Jesus, he will hear you when you call. Never fear the storm or dark, cause you're riding in God's ark. Jesus, yes, Jesus rescues all. He rescued me from troubled water. He rescued me, and now I'm free. He rescued me, and I do love him. Jesus, yes, Jesus rescued me. 
Now when trouble comes my way, I, I call, call on Jesus and I say, Jesus fill my heart and set me free. With that Holy Spirit passes from my being, fear is cast. Jesus, yes, Jesus rescues me. He rescued me from troubled water. He rescued me and now I'm free. He rescued me and I do love him. Jesus, yes, Jesus rescued me. Jesus, yes, Jesus rescued me. I've got a river of life flowing out of me Makes the lame to walk and the blind to see Opens prison doors, sets a captive free I've got a river of life flowing out of me Spring up a well within my soul Spring up a well and make me whole Spring up a well and give to me that life abundantly. Oh, I've, I've got, got a river of life flowing out of me. Makes the lame to walk and the blind to see. Opens prison doors, sets a captive free. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. Spring up a well within my soul. Spring up a well and make me whole. Spring up a well and give to me that life abundantly. Take this whole world, but give me Jesus. Take this whole world, but give me Jesus. Take this whole world, but give me Jesus. I won't turn back, I won't turn back, I have started for the kingdom, I have started for the kingdom, I have started for the kingdom, I won't turn back, I won't turn back. Thank you again for watching the Old Country Church. We'll be back again next week, the Lord willing, with another program. And we're very sorry that we had to cut our program short because of time. Uh, if you do not know Christ as your personal Savior, I want to invite you right now to ask Jesus to come into your life. Just ask him to come in to forgive your sins, and he will. So until next week, we'll see you again. And remember that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Amen.